These gatherings are essential from time to time. They help us to review and renew, to reinterpret and reaffirm. They enable us to introspect and look ahead, to clarify and consolidate our position. They provide a forum for an honest conversation amongst ourselves on our strengths and weaknesses, on where we have succeeded, on where we have failed, on the, on the threats we face, and the opportunities we must trust as a political party. This interaction is different, in at least, this interaction is different in at least two respects from our previous children in Bakari and Shimla. First, it is taking place when we have been in government at the center for almost nine years. It is also taking place when we are not governing in a number of states and when we face serious challenges in states long considered our past. Second, the last nine years have been a period of tremendous economic growth, social change, and technological innovation. New aspirations are manifesting themselves. Yet another special dimension to this conclave, which has been mentioned by Amitaji, a significant number of participants are from the younger generation. This reflects our priorities and resonates with the democratic, uh, democratic reality of our country. <coughs> so, we have before us five subjects to be discussed. First, the political challenges we face. Second, the emerging social and economic concerns that we should take note of and respond to. Third, issues relating to continued discrimination against and atrocities on women and children, and what more must be done for their empowerment. And fourth, India's changing role in a rapidly evolving regional and global environment. And fifth, and last, matters relating to the party organization itself, especially those that have a bearing on our electoral performance. Now, without wanting to anticipate your deliberation, I would like to share a few thoughts with you on each of these subjects. Now, the Congress has many distinctive characteristics, and there are compelling arguments for the Congress way of thinking and the Congress way of doing things. We are the only pan-Indian party, the only political party with a visible and vibrant position in every village, in every country, in every Mohalla of the country. We have a proven record of accomplishment. We appeal to all sections of society. We articulate and champion the concerns of all, but especially of the weaker sections, Dalit, Adivasis, minorities, and women. We, and officers, we have always given the highest priority to the interests and concerns of our farmers and agricultural labor. Inclusiveness for us is not a political ploy only to win elections or to be in government. Inclusiveness is anchored in our convictions. It is not the outcome of any compulsion, as it may be for our political opponents. We are the only part which believes that development and economic growth on the one hand, and social harmony and social justice on the other are two sides of the same coin. But while we continue to be the nation's preeminent political party, 
we must admit that we now face increased competition and inroads have been made into our traditional support base. There are, there are some states where we have been out of office for too long, and although I do believe that being in power is not the sole purpose of political activity, this does have an adverse impact on our morale and organizational ability. In states in which we are in alliance, we have to strike a fine balance between respecting these alliances and ensuring that the party rejuvenation is not compromised. Now, since 2004, the Congress-led UPA government under Prime Minister Dr. Manohar Singhji's leadership has introduced truly revolutionary programs and enacted historic legislation flowing from our manifesto. But in some states, the party has not been able to translate this into political support. I hope this will be discussed and concrete suggestions will emerge from the discussion. Economic growth over the past decade has been impressive. This has had a major impact on reducing poverty. But our fight against inequality and poverty is a continuing one. And this is why I believe it is important to sustain our poverty alleviation growth. There are success stories of development in state after state, but it is also true that while the footprint of achievement is expanding, there are still, still parts of our country which remain lacking. And it is also true that while the center, our UPA government, releases huge financial resources to states, the impact depends significantly on implementation at the local level, which is often wanted. Our party must remain in the forefront in calling for urgent legal action. We see various protest movements across the country relating to land, forest, water, and livelihood, tribal, and gender issues. Our party must proactively take up these concerns. Around one crore youth seek productive jobs year after year. No other country faces such a challenge. Mahatma Gandhi in Narega has demonstrated and is demonstrating its utility in rural areas, but the country has to pay far greater attention to skills employment, especially in semi-urban and urban areas. This requires us to be pragmatic in encouraging investment, which is the only way our employment goals can be achieved. It is the lack of employment, amongst other reasons, that thwarts frustration and also fuels frustration, crime, and violence. Just a little over a decade ago, when we were not in government at the center, we had organized in Delhi a Makita Sasakti Karan allegation. And we had at that time prepared a specific, a specific agenda for action. Our UPA government has taken this agenda forward. New programs have been launched, new laws have been enacted. The women's self-help group movement has received a huge impact. As we all know, there are more than 12 lakh selected women representatives in institutions of local self-government. But I must say with the greatest anguish and pain that discrimination against the girl child continues. Atrocities on women, both in urban and rural India, are a plot 
on our collective conscience and on matters of great shape. The way we still treat women, the prevalence of female criticize, even in economically prosperous regions, the trafficking of children and women, brazen sexual harassment, these are all very disturbing trends that should shake us and awaken. Gender issues are fundamental. They should be of concern to all of us. It is not just the Mahila Congress or women's organizations that should be in the forefront. The entire party must understand it and bring them to the heart of our political activity and change mindset. India's foreign policy has always had a vision, a vision of a country occupying its rightful place and exercising its unique influence in world affairs. That place and that influence will be significantly enhanced by successfully overcoming poverty, improving our economic performance, deepening our secular values, strengthening our democratic institutions, and engaging constructively with the international community. Better and closer relations with our immediate neighbor will not only make for regional peace, they will also have a positive impact on some of our own border states. However, let us be very clear. Our dialogue must be based on accepted principles of civilized behavior. We will never compromise on our vision and preparedness to deal with terrorism and stress on our borders. Let me turn now to some pressing or educational matters. Now, is it not the case that we have squandered many opportunities that people are willing to give us simply because we have been unable to function as a disciplined and united team? In states where we are out of power, especially, we should be coming together, setting aside personal ambitions and egos, and working cohesively so that the party runs. Why do we forget the simple truth that in the party's victory lies the victory of each and every one of us? And we need to not come from past declaration of intent. It has to come from within. Unity is the cry of each and every worker of our great organization, and it is our sacred duty to respond to it. We must build leadership at all levels, a leadership that is proactive and that is not afraid of moving forward and taking up issues and programs which highlight the concerns and aspirations of the people. Performance, not papering, must be the ladder of advancement in our party. And seeing so many of our younger colleagues here, I am tempted to say something on a subject which has always bothered me. And this relates to our lifestyle. Celebrating weddings, festivals, and happy events is one thing. But what of the lavish and ostentatious displays of wealth, pomp, and status? Does this not beg the question, where is this wealth coming from? I hope that you will take this spirit and come up with suggestions and norms that we may all accept and adhere to. <coughs> we have to recognize the new changing India, an India increasingly peopled by a younger, 
more aspirational, more impatient, more demanding, and better educated generation. This is a natural and welcome outcome of a rapid economic and social change that has been brought about by the success of our programs to educate, to empower, and indeed to unshackle the oppressed and disappointed. Our youth is getting more assertive. It wants its voice to be heard. Across the length and breadth of our country, our people are expecting much more from their political parties. Aided by the tools of, of the modern world, television, social media, mobile phones, and the internet, today's India is better informed and better equipped to communicate. The laws that we devised, such as the right to information, and the technology we facilitate, give the people the ability to see more from their elected representatives. Better delivery, stronger responsiveness, greater accountability, and ultimately, demonstrable integrity. Our citizens are rightly fed up to the level of corruption that we see in public life at high levels, but equally with the corruption they have to deal with in their daily life. This is a phenomenon, a journey that we must understand and continue to respond to. We cannot allow our growing educated and middle classes to be disillusioned and alienated from the political process. So friends, we have much to think about, much to deliberate, much to discuss. I want all of you to speak your mind, to be free and frank in whatever you want to do. We are here on serious business which will determine our future. And when we are done, we must go forward with a clear and unified sense of purpose. We must go from fear, recharge, and reinvigorate it. And so I end by saying, let us go down to work straight away. Thank you. Thank you.